So I've recently finished preaching Micah, and I thought it might be helpful to talk about one decision that I had to make while I was preaching it and one application that we ended up spending quite a bit of time in. So the decision, the preaching decision, was about how much time to spend on Micah's particular situation. Micah is, uh, we called him Budget Isaiah. It's a short book uh, from a prophet who is exactly the same time as Isaiah. And one feature of his situation in the book is that he is engaging with false prophets who oppose his message. And that's particularly big in chapter 2 and chapter 3. And for reasons I'll come on to, I ended up spending quite a lot of time on them, uh, maybe two weeks out of the four weeks that I was given for the series. We gave chapter 3 a week on its own. And when we came to chapter 1 and 2 as the first week, we did quite a lot on that situation. And uh, you might want to criticize that decision. There's a lot in chapter 5 about the Messiah. There's a lot in chapter 4 about the new creation and the situation after the exile. But Micah's own situation is he's in Jerusalem warning them about judgment. And there's a load of people saying, shut up. You shouldn't say that. God's not like that. That then led on to the application. I think this is probably why I got excited about the book, why I was so keen to preach it, is that as you look at those false prophets and what is driving them, Micah enables you to get right under their skin. And I think uh, anybody preaching the book will have to make this application, and you'd, you'd want to decide how big to make it in your series. But as you understand those false prophets, I found the contemporary parallels very, very compelling. So the, uh, the false prophets are there in chapter 2, verse 6, telling Micah not to preach. It's disgraceful to talk about judgment and sin. And he recommends the message they should go and take to everybody, which is there in verse 11 of chapter 2. And it's basically, have another drink. Uh, God wants you to have another drink. And uh, that resonated massively with me in the, the kind of recent past of the Church of England, that you're not allowed to talk about sin or judgment, um, but everybody knows God wants you to have another drink and enjoy life now. And then in chapter 3, Micah gets you inside the motives of those prophets, and he develops it as a kind of bribery, that these prophets have been bought. It's not actually that they're scared of saying the truth, it's that they've been paid to give a message that people want. And uh, we thought about that in a couple of different ways. An illustration that we looked at was uh, from a TV series about a GP surgery where somebody went and filmed them about how many drugs they were prescribing, how often they were prescribing drugs and whether that was a good thing or not. And as the program went on, they realized that the way the pharmaceutical company was giving them free stuff and uh, buying them lunch, they realized that was having an effect. There's quite a a fun moment in in the TV series where they realize the penny drops for the doctors, actually, this sandwich that I'm eating right now is affecting my decisions I make with patients. And with the prophets, it is that if you put food in their face, then they will say peace. Uh, If you feed them, they'll give you a message you want. And Micah is different, 3 verse 8, because he's filled with the Spirit of the Lord. And... As I prepared it over the months beforehand, the the application got closer to home the longer I prepared it. So initially, um, I was, I guess, angry with false teachers today and the way that um, they benefit from changing the gospel. Maybe not financially, though in some cases, but in terms of reputation uh, and those kind of things. But then... I got a step closer to me, and I thought about a lot of my close friends who, particularly the the people I grew up with who would make a lot about being spirit-filled and uh, having ministries that are spirit-filled ministries. And Micah 3 verse 8 is very challenging, I think, because the mark of the spirit-filled preacher is that he declares to Jacob his transgression and sin. And actually, that left me... Uh, afraid for some of my friends who make a big claim about being spirit-filled but maybe also are not comfortable publicly talking about sin. And actually, if the spirit-filled person is the one who talks about sin and judgment, I think that would have helped me as a teenager when uh, we were worrying about who had the spirit and who didn't. Um, Actually, 
the, the grumpy old Micah who is telling people about uh, God's judgment, that sort of boldness is a sign of the Spirit of God. And But having kind of looked at applications that far from me, it then came right home to me. And I thought about what I actually tell my friends. And for our congregation, what, what do we actually say about God to our friends? And one of the questions we encourage people to go away and think about, or even use with their friends, would be, how would your friends describe the God that you believe in? Uh, Micah, I think, is a book about who is God, who is like God. That's what Micah's name means, who is like Yahweh. And that's where the book ends in 7 verse 18. Um, if you asked all my non-Christian friends, uh, the God that Charlie believes in, um, is he angry with sin? Is he intending to bring judgment? Does he forgive bad people? Or is he about rewarding good people? And I think that would be an interesting, a challenging question to ask my friends. So uh, Micah, uh, I think, sent us away challenged but encouraged um, and wanting to tell people about the real God who is salvation after judgment. Mm -hmm.